And I need to tell you that uh, this week and next week, I am uh, not uh, preaching. I am uh, on vacation uh, only for this hour on Sunday morning. Uh, you you and, didn't uh, get the round of applause you expected. Uh, no, 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 I didn't. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Jim is preaching this week and Nancy is preaching uh, next week. Uh, we, we call her Mary. We call her Mary, you call her Nancy. I did it again. Yeah, you did. This is, a, this is another historic moment. <laughs> and Mary is preaching next, next week. There's no excuse for that. <laughs> I'll tell you someday why it happens, uh, as soon as I figure it out. Um, and then on the third, uh, I will be back in the pulpit. The reason, one reason I wanted to introduce Jim is because he has just uh, uh, accomplished something. He has uh, been, uh, you have achieved. I have achieved pulpit supply in the, central in the East District of the Central Texas Conference. Yes. I am the first and so far the only uh, certified layperson for pulpit supply. Pulpit supply means if a church like this one were to have a pastor who either is out sick on vacation or uh, for some reason can't, f can't fulfill the pulpit, um, they would call the conference and the conference would send someone out to, to bring the message to them. And that's what I am. And Jim to is the first uh, lay person in the whole history of the East District who has ever done this. Well, it, it's fairly new. They just started it in 2016. Okay. You're still the first. I am the first. All right. Here's Jim. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so uh, I drive past this church over here in East Fort Worth. Uh, it's over in the Stop Six neighborhood every once in a while. And it has one of those signs out front, very similar to us, except they put these cute sayings on their little sign out front. You know what I mean. Uh, sometimes you'll drive by and I'll say, sign broken, come inside for message. Okay. Um, and I drove past the other day and it said, don't believe everything you think. And I thought, what does that even mean? Why would, why would we think something that we don't believe? Well, bottom line, I really don't think we do. Um, each of us has our own opinions on life. and Well, you can't tell somebody their opinion's wrong because it's their opinion. And I don't have to believe your opinion, and you certainly don't have to believe mine. But can we live in harmony if we don't agree? Gosh, I hope so. Um, and you have an opinion. And you are very passionate about it. Nothing that I say is going to change your mind on what you think. So why? Why, why do we believe that way? Why, why do I believe the ways that I believe? My grandmother, she was a wonderful person. She was, a, she was tough. She buried her first husband and her youngest child after a boating accident. And she was tough but loving all at the same time. She went to church every Sunday. Uh, I remember her telling me that the thing she disliked about church was the gossip. Okay? Uh, she taught me how to fish. She fished probably every day of her life. Um, she was very independent. But I heard her refer to people that were different than us, and she used very disrespectful language. And I don't know if it was living through two world wars or the Great Depression, but those were her opinions. And I didn't have those opinions. I didn't grow up that way. She never spoke to me about people that were different than me but my mother did. And my mom taught me that things like gender, skin color, sexual orientation, those things don't matter. She taught me to treat everyone with the exact same respect. Now my mom also taught me to eat my dessert first, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> So we all have our own experiences and we, we formed our own opinions on things, 
on world events and on religion and on politics and just about everything under the sun, including the sun. But as unique human beings, we're going to have opinions that don't match someone else's, perhaps even someone that we hold dear and love. So how do we live in harmony with those that, we don't, that don't think the same as we do? I don't have the answers to all of these questions. I'm hoping that God does, and I'm hoping we can find out. So I, I, I looked to my Bible, and I, I looked to my Bible to see if there was anything in the Bible about conflict, conflict resolution. And any of you that have read the Bible will realize there is a lot of conflict in the Bible. But first and foremost, we're instructed to love one another. We're to be patient and kind and tender-hearted to each other. We're called to live in peace and harmony with each other. We're called to bear each other's burdens. And it seems that if we're in conflict, it's really hard for us to be Christ-like. In Romans 12, Paul tells us that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. You see, even, even Paul knew that all conflict can't be resolved. Because he says, if, if it's possible. So why should we even try if, it's, if it might not be able to be resolved? Well, I think it's because that's what God wants. You know the verse... That what you do to the least of these? Seems that if you're in conflict with someone, you're in conflict with God. Now, does that mean that God won't listen to our prayers? No, I don't think so. But it may cloud our connection. Most importantly, if you're, not, if you're in conflict, you're, you're not happy. Now, right now, the church is in conflict. No, not St. Matthew per se, but our United Methodist Church is. And they're in conflict over this gay issue, which with my upbringing shouldn't be an issue at all. And the craziest part of this conflict is what man has put in our book of discipline, not what Jesus has said. This conflict's not just hurting ourselves, it hurts other people. Have you ever gone to somebody's house for dinner or a party and the host couple, they're just bickering at each other the whole time? And that arguing it just makes everybody feel uncomfortable, not to mention it's annoying. And sometimes I think that's how maybe our guests here feel when we're talking about conflict within the church, is that they're uncomfortable with it. I've been reading in the book of Titus lately. It's one of those little teeny tiny books that's hard to find. And Paul is talking to Titus about what Titus is supposed to go to Crete to preach on. It seems there's conflict in the church of Crete. About, and the conflict is about whether the circumcised or the uncircumcised can be followers of Christ. Now, I read that passage from Genesis earlier about how in order to keep God's covenant that all men had to be circumcised. And it seems that if you're not, that you are incompatible with Christian teachings. But in the New Testament, Paul is telling Titus to teach these believers to be self-controlled, to teach them to slander no one, to be peaceable, and consider it, and always be gentle toward everyone. You see, he's trying to get the focus off of the conflict and back over here to the teachings of Jesus. There comes a time in any conflict that it has to be addressed, though. And in fact, the conflict, if it it isn't addressed, will get worse. You know that saying that time heals all wounds? Let your wounds sit there and it's going to get infected and it's going to fester. And that's exactly what happens with conflict. 
It has to be addressed. And the quicker it's addressed, the quicker it can heal. All right, so this is where my sermon went. I use the language incompatible with Christian teachings because that's the language that's in our book that we're trying to get removed. And I thought my sermon had turned mean. And that's not where I wanted it to go. So I talked to some folks that I valued their opinion and I prayed about it. And what I've come to realize, to realize what God showed me was that that wasn't mean. It's just factual. That's where the church was. And eventually, we, the church, we got it all figured out. So now men don't have to be circumcised to be Christians. Women don't have to cover their heads to come into church. We can eat so many foods that used to be completely forbidden. And we don't have to have a priest to talk to God. We can do that ourselves directly through prayer. And it was Jesus that did all of that for us. I was having a conversation with Max and Jackie and a few others uh, a few weeks ago after we had gone to a, uh, a conference and we listened to three very good speakers and they were talking to us about the, 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 the way forward and the one church plan in specific. And I think it was Jackie, I think it was your sister Mac, uh, Jackie that said that the problem has already been solved. You see, the younglings of today they don't see an issue at all with sexuality or gender. And the millennials, those that are a little older, they don't see a problem with sexuality or gender. And you go a little older to the Gen Xers, and they don't see this same problem that we see. And you get to my generation, the baby boomers, and we're split on this issue. But you go back a few more generations, even before our grandparents, and they were in a different time. And they might have been slightly split on this issue, but if, in their mind, if it wasn't one man and one woman, it was abnormal. You see, God didn't create this problem. We did. We made this an issue. We created the problem, but God's already solved it. He solved it long before we ever even made it a problem. Let's listen to what Paul says about, uh, about getting along with each other in the Bible. This is uh, from his letter to uh, the church in Ephesus. He says, I urge you then, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with each other. See, where we need to be is not on one side or the other. We're not going to change someone's opinion. Where we need to be is compassionate and understanding. Where we need to be is knowing that even though we may disagree, that this is our brother or our sister, a fully affirmed child of God. Now you've heard me say that I don't like labels and I don't like us putting labels on people. I want us to know that we are all fully affirmed children of God, equal in His eyes. Now what about you? Are you in conflict right now? Are you living in harmony with God? Any relationship can have conflict. Whether it's a relationship between friends, or family, or partners, conflict is going to happen. And when it does, don't let it get too big. Work it out. Work it out before it festers into a wound that can't be healed. Try to see that other person's side of the matter and determine whether or not what you're in conflict about is really a big deal or not. 
Now, I've noticed that when Paul is writing these letters to all these different churches that frequently they are in conflict. You see, there always seems to be conflict in the church. And they always get through it. And we're going to get through it too. We're going to get through it by bringing Jesus into our hearts. We're going to do so by loving our neighbors. We're going to do so by looking at that big picture and seeing that this isn't really that much of an issue at all. We should be concentrating on our goals, our goals of making disciples of Jesus by spreading that good news of Christ, by taking care of those that are less fortunate than we are. We should do so by living that Methodist motto. It's on the front of your bulletin. That Methodist motto of open hearts, open minds, open doors. So don't believe everything you think. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this by knowing that our God, our one true God, He's got it. He's already got this. He's already solved it. any problems that we can create. And normally at the conclusion of a sermon, we have a prayer. And I couldn't think of anything any better than what Paul had already written. This is also from his uh, letter to the church in Ephesus. His words are so strong, as strong today as they were way back then. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with, his, with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Amen.